Hi, this is Metric, and I'm here at my home studio in London, and uh, I'm going to be talking about my uh, latest single, Hackers, uh, the creative process behind it, um, as well as the production techniques, some of the mixing techniques. Um, I'm going to be talking about sort of synthesizing drums and how I go about getting my drum sound, um, and yeah, some hopefully some useful bits along the way. So, hope you enjoy the video. Okay, um, so. I'm going to talk a little bit, a bit about the creative process of how this track came together and um, it started off um, with a concept and the concept was to create a track that was incredibly simple based around uh, one riff and one riff only so essentially the riff is uh, the bass line and the main hook um, so in order for that to work, I needed to create a sound that uh, was big enough to fill up the frequency spectrum. Um, and uh, yeah, so that started off with uh, this riff. And uh, the actual sound itself, I think this may even be an older version of the riff, but it'll give you an idea. Uh, so yeah, so that sound um, is, is quite interesting because um, it, th there's, there's different articulations of it depending on uh, where they were played um, uh, or which octave they were uh, played on. Um, so I created um, an instrument rack and um, I essentially had, um, uh, I separated the instrument rack so uh, by key. So so essentially in Ableton what you can do is when you, when you create an instrument rack is you can assign uh, ranges um, of, of MIDI notes uh, to groups of instruments. So what I did here was I took the first, sort of in, in the lower registers, um, I've got the sub here and then uh, the mid bass patch which I made in Serum which kind of is, is the more kind of staccato um, sound. And that, that was essentially um, a, a sawtooth um, with uh, 16 voices laid up in unison, detuned, um, with a pretty harsh resonant filter on the attack, uh, which is controlled by this LFO here. So it kind of has that plucked kind of grungy sound to it. Um, that is then underpinned by the sub, which is sitting underneath it there. And that's very simply uh, a sine wave, again, in Serum. Um, and just to talk a little bit about subs as well, because um, if you use just a pure uh, sine wave, then you're essentially only getting the fundamental of, of the wave. Um, and this can be fine in some cases, but uh, a lot of the time, you know, you kind of want your sub to fill out a bit more of the low end, um, not only because it, it, it can sound bigger, but also it will translate better onto systems which aren't capable of reproducing that sub, for example, iPhones or laptop speakers. So in order to give, give the bass a little bit more presence, um, I'll often open up the wavetable editor, and here you can actually control the fundamental and the harmonics of a sound. So here I've added a bit of the, the first harmonic here. Obviously you can add more in, and you, kind of, you can give the sound a little bit more body and tone, so you can hear the sound changing, more harmonics going up the frequency spectrum. But yeah, in this case, I just used the first harmonic laid with the fundamental, so that fills it out nicely, uh, and then obviously combined with sound. And then, um, so the riff itself, it kind of goes up into the, uh, the next octave, so I wanted to have a slightly different articulation of that sound. Uh, so to go into a bit more depth about that. So on this version of the sound, you can hear that the cutoff is a lot more open. So it's essentially the same sound as the more staccato version, um, except that there's a, a far less kind of harsh um, sort of attack on the uh, filter cutoff. So when you play these together, you hear the whole riff together. And you can kind of see the MIDI notes moving up there based on the assignment. 
Um, and yeah, just to kind of go into a bit more detail about how I came up with the riff, um, I actually used this kind of comically looking, but very, very useful uh, MIDI guitar. I'll show you, there you go. Um, I mean, it kind of looks like a toy uh, on first glance, but uh, it's actually very powerful because it, it's, it works as a, uh, a MIDI instrument as well. And uh, what I did with this, so I, I kind of created the patch, and then I, I guess because guitar is, is the instrument I'm most comfortable with, uh, it was a lot easier to, uh, I often find it a lot easier to come up with riffs and stuff. And uh, yeah, so I literally just kind of jammed away. It was like, so that's the kind of vibe. And then obviously recorded in the MIDI. Um, and then, uh, so obviously there's like a lot of processing on that sound to kind of make it full and uh, to try and help it fill up as much of the frequency spectrum as possible. Um, so often what I'll do with uh, those kinds of sounds, because you, you know, I'll, I'll be adding like a lot of um, you know, like distortion and saturation. Um, I think within the patch itself, there's like a lot of distortion, there's a dimension expander, and uh, sort of using the built-in multiband compressor in, uh, in Serum. So it often sort of extends the release of sounds uh, quite dramatically. So you're getting lots of kind of tails and kind of unwanted um, sort of noise uh, in sound. So what I'll usually do is I'll, I'll, I'll get the sound kind of, you know, as overdriven as, as, as I need it to be. Um, and then I'll bounce it as audio. Um, to, so then you'll have a lot more control over, you know, like the tails of the sounds and making sure they don't bleed into each other. Um, so in this case, what I did was I separated um, like the staccato notes, so you can hear there. And obviously the high ones on the octave. Um, essentially, what I did once I'd, I'd bounced out the audio was was kind of auditioned, um, you know, which which of these bass notes sounded the best, um, and also kind of checked things like phase and made sure that you know they they have had the strongest amplitude. Um, so once I'd kind of taken the strongest notes, and what I did here was just like like repeated quite a few of them, so it kind of gives it quite like a almost synthetic robotic edge you know rather than just letting the riff play out by itself and you know each kind of instance of the note will have a slightly different character because the oscillators are starting at different points so this way you can get you know the the sort of optimum levels of amp amplitude per note um, and yeah so that's that's kind of one of the advantages of, of, of you know bouncing it down to audio and you know with, with each instance you know i i've kind of eq'd them differently um and yeah so so when they all come together you know you're going to get a much cleaner sound um okay so uh, once i had the uh the sort of main riff uh bounced down to audio and separated kind of e and eq'd in its different uh in it, you know its different states um i then grouped those tracks together and did a bit of further processing um, so, I mean, one of the kind of obvious things you would need to do with a sound like this is to uh, kind of monoize uh, the lower frequencies and Ableton's utility plugin actually does that really quickly. Um, as you can see here, we've got um, the, the bass mono switch here, which will essentially put everything, depending on what you choose here, and in this case below 500 hertz into mono. So that kind of reduces any or sort of eliminates any phase issues you might have with those lower um, harmonics. Um, I then uh, use this EQ here, which is great. This is a, a soft tube. I think it comes with the um, Native Instruments Complete. Um, but it's really good for like adding kind of top air, you know, really high frequency stuff. Um, and here I kind of gave it a boost at 12K, like a high shelf, which um, if I actually turn off these effects, you'll be able to hear what I'm doing a bit better. Um, so before, and using that kind of, just kind of lifted those tops a little bit more. Um, and then next uh, I had uh, a mid-side EQ, um, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about the uh, mid-side processing a bit later, because that was quite a, a large part of the, uh, the mix down process. Um, so. Uh, just to keep it brief, in, the, in this case I just used Ableton's EQ8, put it in side mode and just rolled off some of the tops and the high mids 
because uh, I wanted a bit more emphasis on, on the lower mids when it came to the stereo content of this sound. Um, and then essentially what I had after that, yeah, so just a simple roll off on the lows. Um, the API 550A, which is a, a great sort of EQ by Waves, which kind of a, a, have more of a colorization EQ. Um, so I, I, I quite like to add, add in quite a lot of stuff with, with this EQ. Um, so yeah, that's really just giving it a bit more presence. Um, so I've boosted up here around 12.5 kilohertz, again at 3 kilohertz and, and at 400, because uh, I felt that the sound was perhaps lacking a bit of that. Um, and then next up, um, I've got an LFO tool, and, and this is actually, again, part of, part of the mixing process, but, um, you know, uh, I find it a really good way, um, instead of, you know, traditionally using sidechain compression to duck against the uh, kick and the snare, um, I actually prefer to do it in LFO tool, or at least at the time of making this track. And um, what this gives you the ability to do is to, you know, you, you can actually put in your own curves uh, and, and tell the sound to how you know how you want it to dynamically change when the, the kick and the snare hit. So you don't always you, you might not necessarily want the same amount of um, volume reduction on the kick as you do the snare. And similarly um, on the second kick in the sequence, because you know for example, if I play this to you without LFO tool, So you're hearing the riff with, with no ducking at all. And then if I switch it on. So, you know, you can really hear how it's, it's ducking on the kick and it's ducking slightly less on the snare. And then again, when the next kick plays, um, we're doing slightly less ducking because I find that, you know, for example, if this was a sidechain compressor, you'd have something essentially like this. So both each time the kick drum plays, you're getting quite a dramatic ducking on the sound uh, and that and that can actually it, it can it can actually ruin the sort of groove of, of the riff like in this case if I, if I play it with the drums see that doesn't sound quite right because it's ducking too much on the second kick so you know here I would actually just make that curve less extreme um, so yeah that, that basically is a really good way of resolving uh, that that issue um, and you know you, you're getting really clean cuts then um, but the one thing you, you really need to be uh, aware of when because uh, LFO tool is, is a MIDI synced effect so it essentially uses your host's clock in order to accurately um, reproduce uh, whatever it is you're telling it to do so in, in the case of Ableton um, it's actually subject to um, to uh, delay uh, like latency essentially. So if you put anything uh, prior to it in the chain that introduces latency, then this plugin will either be, well, it will essentially not, not be in sync and it won't be perfectly compensated for. Um, so if I just give you an example of that, uh, make it kind of a, a bit more extreme to demonstrate the effect. If I put like an ozone maximizer here um, and because this is, it's a limiter. It's going to be introducing quite a lot of latency. And if, if you hover over the plugin in Ableton, you can actually see how much latency that is creating. So in this case, it's 721 samples. So that's introducing a latency of that value. Um, now, if I then play the sound, you hear how the ducking is now out of time. And um, uh, you know that that could actually, you know, uh, that's quite a crucial thing when, when you're doing your mixes because you know you, you want your transients to be clean, you want everything to be synced up and perfect. Um, Ableton does an amazing job of that. Uh, otherwise, with its plug-in delay compensation, if you're using kind of audio-based effects such as compressors, and but as soon as you introduce a MIDI-based uh, uh, effect, uh, you are going to uh, going to get this latency issue. So. A uh, really easy way of solving that is, uh, so see here, we've created 721 samples of latency. An LFO tool very conveniently has this offset here. So what you'll then do is just match that with the, uh, with the latency readout. So in this case, it is 721 
I think there's a bit of latency somewhere else as well on the pass key. So that'd be 75 latency. And there you go, we're back in sync again. So yeah, always good to be mindful of that when you're using LFO tool, especially on groups or if you're introducing other plugins in the chain that, that uh, cause latency. Okay, so uh, moving on. Um, yeah, so the next thing, uh, once I'd established the riff, um, was to um, get the drum track going. And um, yeah, and, and again, sort of in line with the concept of the track, I wanted the drums to be as simple and as uh, punchy as possible. Um, so just to expand a little bit on the drums. So very simple, just a kick, a snare and a hi-hat. Um, and yeah, just to kind of delve a little bit deeper into what I've got going on here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit as well about sort of how, you know, my approach to sort of synthesizing drums as well and how I kind of get my drum sound. Um, but yeah, if we listen to, to each hit in isolation, um, so this is the main kick. And, you know, I, I, I like to have quite a synthetic sound to my drums, but also uh, with uh, like a live feel too. So they're not, they're not too synthetic, you know, they, they still feel that, you know, they could be coming from a live drum kit. But I like to have as much control over them as possible in order to, you know, create a kind of as, as clean and, and clubby sound as possible. Um, so, yeah, so that's, that's my kick drum, and I'll go back into a bit more detail about that in a sec. Um, my snare drum here. So that's the first layer, and that's, that's essentially a, a snare which I, I probably took from another, another project, um, but, you know, what ends up happening a lot of the time is, you know, these kind of rendered snares will be mixed with other snares from other projects and, and enveloped and, you know, various different processes will happen to them along the way to create their results. So it's often not um, a, a kind of linear approach to making, uh, to, to making snare drums or kicks for that matter. Um, that's then layered with this kind of 80s layer here to give it that kind of like wide sort of roomy kind of Phil Collins sound. Uh, it's quite kind of typical of my production style to, to use that, that kind of aesthetic with my drums. Um, and yeah, just a, a little bit of processing uh, went on here. So using the DS10 drum shaper, um, I just eased off a bit of the tail because I was actually going to add more tail to it with the other layer. So it's important to get that down a bit. Um, and then again, I used LFO tool here um, just to just to shave off a bit more of the tail more accurately. Um, you know, again, DS10 drum shaper down here is introducing 416 samples. So I made sure I inputted that into LFO tool in order to keep everything in sync. Um, then on the, the 80s layer, um, I, yeah, because all, all the attack is coming from the other layer. So I wanted to carve out a bit of room for that, you know, and also to avoid any, any phasing issues. Um, Rolled off a bit of the tops, and again, DS10 drum shaper, bring that, that's, that bring the uh, sustain a little bit down. And then combined, you know, they kind of sound quite, quite weighty together. Um, so yeah, I mean, I mean, there is. Uh, I've, I've wanted to kind of go into detail about making my drums for a while now, and uh, I figured this would be a good opportunity to do that. Um, I've got a bit of a here's one I made earlier. Uh, example of, of how I would typically make a snare drum. So um, for this, um, I'm actually only using Operator uh, to do it. So, but this can be done in any synth, whether it's Serum or whatever it is, is your sort of most comfortable um, sort of plugin to work in. Um, and yeah, I, I, I guess with, with drum hits, you know, I, I, I think of them as three main components. So you've got your transient, which is when the stick hits the snare drum, the initial attack of the sound. Um, your fundamental, which is like the, the note of the drum, the, the kind of the, the resonant boom or the, the sound it makes uh, that resonates with the drum um, to kind of create the, the tone of the snare. And then you've got the tail, which is essentially the, the ringing out of, of the snare drum and, and the kind of fizz um, and then, you know, obviously you, you, I, I like to add other layers too to kind of fill out the mids a little bit more and give it character. So 
Um, so yeah, just to go into into how I would typically create those sounds. So here is the uh, the transient. So obviously it doesn't sound too much by itself, but um, if I kind of reverse engineer how I went about making that sound, so so here on operator you've got your uh, your oscillators, and um, before you start working uh, on a sound like this, uh, it's quite crucial to put the synth in in sort of series mode here. Otherwise, what will happen because it's an FM synthesizer, you'd essentially be layering waves on top of each other to kind of frequency modulate each other, and that won't create the desired uh, uh, sound that you you'll need to make drums. Um, unless you're going a bit abstract, of course. Uh, but in this case, we're, we're just creating uh, a transient. So if you listen to this one here, we've got essentially, uh, I've just pulled up a sine wave here. Um, I've cranked the decay right the way down to 113, given it a quite a short release. Um, and then essentially the, the kind of, the, the, the bite of the transient is coming from the pitch envelope here. So you can assign the pitch envelope to whichever uh, destination or oscillator you want. So in this case, it's assigned to A. And then we've just got like a very, very, very quick, sharp attack on this, uh, sorry, to K. Um, the peak is where the note starts. So here, it's starting at 48. And uh, yeah, so essentially, it's starting from 48 semitones up, and then it's arriving here at the at the sort of the, the frequency, which is at uh, 285 hertz. Um, so there, so there you have it. That's our, our the first part of our transient. Um, and if you know, you can kind of see on the uh, frequency analyzer that you know it's mostly sort of hitting around you know two to three k as, as the main sort of bite of it. You don't want too many tops, but then you you will want to fill out the tops just a little bit. So then what I'll do is I'll layer that with a, uh, a bit of white noise and. Good thing about operator is you can actually um, choose noise loops as opposed to noise white. And what noise loop does is it essentially, you know, it's it's creating, it's generating white noise based on a particular sample, and it's it's starting at the same point every single time. So um, if I play that by itself, it's a tiny bit of white noise there. Obviously, you can change the phase here to kind of start at a different point. But when I load those two together. We then got our transient, and again, like this is a very, you know, the envelope I put on this is similar to, to what I did with the sine wave, except I cranked the attack up a bit because I wanted the there to be, you know, the sine wave to, to occupy more of the attack. Um, so yeah, once I've got the transient done, I'll then go to the fundamental. So, uh, you know, very similarly, I um, created uh, just a sine wave here. And then you know we've got our decay down uh, to about 95, um, and you know really you, you want this to be uh, a fairly, you know, obviously it needs to be longer than the transient, um, uh, but you know with a bit of sort of um, trial and error, you know you can get it to to the right sort of length that you want it to be, um, and you know in this case uh, again just very simple, just a bit of. Uh, Bit of a pitch envelope on the attack of the sound, and that's only coming from 12 oct uh, sorry 12 semitones up. Um, and again, I, I, I didn't use fixed mode this time. Um, obviously, you can use fixed mode uh, to sort of determine the exact frequency you want the snare to hit at. So in this, you know, for example, here uh, the the tune is in the key of F, and therefore I probably try and tune the drums to F. Uh, 174, 175 hertz is around about F. Um, so, you know, probably a good good place to start. You know, obviously, if you want to pitch the snare slightly higher, you know, you can crank this up. But yeah. So in this case, snare tune to F, and there, if you look at the MIDI, it's sitting at F. Um, and yeah, and what I did here was just put a, put a little bit of a gap between the transient and the, the fundamental. So these two guys aren't, aren't kind of overla overlapping and phasing, and that's something you need to be really careful about when when you create these individual layers. Is that they they're not sort of you know you're not getting any phase cancellation through either layering them together or, or putting them in sequence. 
And um, yeah, just moving on into the tail now, uh, which is a little bit more of a complex sound um, due to quite a lot of the processing I did afterwards. But if I switch that off, um, we can have a look at that in a bit more detail. So yeah, we started off with, again, uh, noise looped. Um, you can actually go for noise white with this one, but you just got to be aware that each time it plays, it will sound a bit different. Um, so I'll keep it on that for now. Um, obviously we've got the frequency up quite high. As I turn it up, it's going to be a bit brighter. So yeah, we're starting off with very basic white noise. Um, again here we've got the, uh, the, uh, the, the envelope of the sound with a slightly longer attack in order to let the transient and fundamental come through. Um, with, a, with a longer decay and a longer release, because you know, if you think about a snare, you've got that, that kind of ringing out of the snare in the tops. Kind of put these together. Kind of very basic, kind of synthetic sounding snare. Doesn't sound like much at the moment, but um, we can go into just a few of the steps along the way to help it along. And um, yeah, so what I did here, I literally just gave it a bit more presence there, around 5K. I think it's quite crucial to have that, that sort of presence up there. You don't want it to be too, too high, like fizzy tops, because um, that, yeah, that can sound quite unnatural and harsh. And a lot of snares have their presence around sort of three to 5K, even going up to like 8K. So the little boost there helped. I've got an auto filter here, which essentially just doing a very quick sweep, like a um, just kind of like add that character in a little bit. The time the resonance, you can hear it a little bit more. But yeah, I wanted to kind of take away a little bit of that low as it's as it's kind of as the sound is progressing. Um, obviously, I've got a, a utility there just to bring the volume up a bit. Um, what, I, what I quite like to do with my tails is to just. Uh, put a lot of saturation on them and, and this can actually you know help fill out the, the tail a bit more and, and kind of help glue it together and, and just create more of like a unified sound. So here yeah that's it's actually increasing the, 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 the release of the tail a little bit there. You've got your reverb here I mean like normally I probably wouldn't go for something like uh, just the stock Ableton reverb although it is good um, I'll probably draw for something like the Valhalla uh, Vintage, which is actually my current favourite reverb. But that's, that's going to give you a bit more of a realistic kind of room em emulation. Um, I'll just fire up a preset quickly here, say, I don't know. And I like it because obviously it's got, you know, a 1980s setting. Um, but yeah, that, that's going to, you know, really help bring your snare to life and give it, put it inside a space essentially, make it sound more realistic and not like it's come straight out of a synthesizer. Um, so yeah, again here, I'll just switch back to how I had before. I'm just like filling up a, a bit of the, the low mids here, taking away of a lot of that really, really high stuff. I mean, essentially, when, you, when you're working with white noise, it's going from zero hertz right away to the top. So there's a lot of unwanted high stuff there. So yeah, you really don't want to take, take the top off there. Um, and then, yeah, just to finish that sound off, uh, a bit more control on the, on the dynamics. So I added a utility at the end of the chain. And then I've, I've essentially just drawn in this curve here. So if you kind of bring that out a bit more. And that's going to that's going to control the tail of your sound. You can get really like precise, sort of, um, you know, over the the dynamics of the sound simply by using you know utility. Um, moving on to the clap. I mean, obviously this is done in a in pretty much the same way, although it isn't actually a clap. It's just again a bit of white noise. And yeah, so that was created with um, just simple white noise. I then added a filter. And using the envelope of the filter, um, it's sweeping up through the sound uh, with quite a high resonance. If I take it off, for example, turn it on. Got a bandpass filter here, and that's kind of you know giving you that that sweep up around the frequency range, which is kind of like arriving at around 1.5k, which is pretty much where a clap should be. Um, you know, I, th I think a lot you know a lot of time a lot of the time these days, I like to have a lot of presence around 1.5k because you know, you're kind of giving your drums that presence, you're filling up the mids and you know it, it does add uh, a kind of perceived weight to them. Um, so again here uh, what I did with the, I actually created an audio effect rack so then this gives you 
um, ultimate control over you know, the dry and wet of a sound without needing to use uh, sends and returns. Um, so I often like to do it with when I'm processing drums like this um, because essentially what I've got here is I've, I've got a 100% wet reverb. Uh, I'm not entirely sure why that says dry. That should say wet. We'll just change that. There we go. Um, and yeah, so I can basically have the sound dry and then I can have full control over the wet there. And again, what I've done to you know, adjust the dynamics of that is just to do a simple volume curve on, on the chain. So I'm actually controlling the, 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 the level of the chain here. And then, yeah, just to finish off, again, rolling off the tops. Um, and that, yeah, that's, that's it pretty much. Uh, if we play all those layers together, I mean, it won't sound, you know, like, like a fully uh, polished or um, realised snare, like the one I've used in the track, but, you know, th this is really just to give you an idea of, of where it starts and, and how I, I come about these sounds. Um, so, yeah, to all together, that kind of sounds like that, which, you know, given that there, is, there aren't any, like, live layers going on there at all that's coming 100% out of the synthesizer, it doesn't sound too bad. Um, and you know, a few take like main takeaways from this are, you know, uh, different tracks will will essentially um, command different aesthetics of snares. Uh, they'll uh, you know different tunings. You know, for example, in this track, I needed a snare which was in F. Um, you might write a track in G, and you'll have full control over what pitch the fundamental sits at. So yeah, you can really just get, go, go deep and, and really find your own sound with, with your drums by synthesizing them from scratch. Not only that, you're also gonna get a much cleaner sound and you know, you're gonna be able to deliver um, sort of quite a lot of like sonic um, accuracy when you're making it yourself. Um, and then, yeah, just like the, the final step of what I would do here is I, I would probably, well, I would definitely freeze them um, and start working with them in audio. Because again, what I referred to earlier about kind of, you know, um, phase cancellation when working with layers, that's really crucial when you're working with drums. So I'm looking at, uh, let's have a look. I don't know what a fundamental looks like that. Uh, that bounced the wrong one. So here we go. If I just bounce these as audio. Okay, so right, we've now got these as audio. And this is uh, a crucial part of the process because as I mentioned earlier, you need to be very aware of uh, phase cancellation when it comes to you know, layering drums and, and sort of synthesizing them. So you know, in, in this case, you can see here that the transient is actually overlapping a bit with the fundamental. And if you look at the peaks and troughs of these, uh, of the waveform here, um, Obviously, we've got kind of full polarity here, and we've got negative polarity here. So, yeah, so those two will give you problems. So, you know, a very quick and easy way to overcome that, you can either just use volume envelopes like this. And again, you're still getting a bit of overlap there. But if you're fairly happy with the, the levels of these, then you can actually just put them together, put a little crossfade there. And there you go, zero phase cancellation issues. There you go. It's kind of yeah. A lot again. A lot of it is trial and error, and you know, kind of working on a macro level. So, um, I, I, you know, try not to be kind of intimidated by going into this kind of level of detail, because uh, once you've done it a few times, done a bit of practice, it can um, become quite easy and quite quick. So yeah, then you've got your, your tail. And then you clap there. So yeah, and then you got those together. You can really just kind of go in and just tweak it, you know, tweak it to your taste and your style. You know, other times you might just want to completely throw out the rule book, and I, I quite often do this. Just you know, saturate the whole thing, distort the whole thing, bring out more harmonics in 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 the fundamental. You know, you can either do that with uh, something like overdrive. If I just isolate that for a second, we'll bring that down to 174 where the fundamentals at, bring the key down, take the tone away. Uh, right, so 
if I bring up a analyzer, I'll show you in a bit more detail about how we can add some harmonics looks into that. So as I'm cranking up, obviously it doesn't sound amazing at the moment, but yeah, so here we go. We've now introduced a few more harmonics into the snare drum, yeah, which can help fill it out a bit. And a real snare drum will have harmonics like that too. So, um, and yeah, you might also want to consider, you know, layering with some live snares as well, um, which is pretty much what I do quite often. Um, Addictive Drums is great for this, just for sourcing very clean, well-recorded drum hits. Um, we'll just find the snare here. Let's bring the velocity up. Go. We'll just use that for the time being. Um, and then in here, we'll choose our snare. Just take everything off it, because essentially we're just finding a good snare drum here. Take all the effects off, meet the overheads, the room and the bus. And there we go, nice clean snare there. Um, you know, you might want to mess around with the snare buzz a bit. I mean, in this case, we're just yeah, we're just looking at, at the sort of harmonics and kind of adding a little bit more realism into the snare around the transient and the uh, fundamental, not so much the tail, I don't think, for a snare drum like this. So yeah, once I'm, I'm happy with that, um, I'll then resample it. And now I've got it as audio. And then you, then you can line it up with your, your transient and your fundamental. And just check out the phase and see how these, these are interacting with each other. Um, obviously at the moment it's actually a different pitch I believe. Yeah, so it's a, we need to go a bit lower actually. So if I take that down, a good way of finding matching the pitch of, of layering drums is simply just to, you know, drag, drag the D-tune up and down and see, you know, do it until the waveforms line up. And then you can see that like when they're perfectly in phase. So now these two should. Yeah, so now they're, they are layered nicely. Um, you'll know when they're not layered nicely because if I invert the phase here with utility, you can hear the fundamental just disappear. If I put it back on, uh, sorry, if I take it off. There you go, we get a fundamental back. So yeah, those two are layered now layered quite nicely. I'd probably you know do something, I'd probably take the, the top end off. Another thing to, to be aware of as well, like when using like Ableton stock EQ, um, I'd probably go for something a bit more precise with this, like um, I'd probably go for like Pro Q. Pro Q3 is pretty, pretty good these days. Um, you know, you, you could you could put it into natural phase mode just to remove any sort of phase issues going on, which will again introduce a bit more latency into your project. So if you're if you're mixing or tracking, I probably wouldn't advise doing this. This would need to be a process that that would happen in, in a separate project. Um, so yeah, here we can just. Bring out some of those harmonics. And that's really going to help it sound a bit more organic. You go for a more extreme curve. Yeah, so yeah, a lot of trial and error. But these are the fundamentals of, of how, you, how you get there. And if we then play all those together, not too bad. Take tail fair maybe, and that one. Yeah, so that that wouldn't you know that's not a bad place to start for a, for a DMB snare. Um, again, here I'd you know so there wasn't any kind of conflict between the transient and the live layer I just introduced. I probably just put a little fade there. Take off some of the tail there. And remove it. So it just it just sounds it just sounds a little bit empty, a bit flat. Doesn't sound very real. And then with it, kind of sounds a bit more like a snare. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much um, you know how I go about making my snare drums. Uh, you know, obviously, like I said earlier, a lot of the snares I'll use in final tracks will be sort of Frankenstein's of other snares that I've made across different projects and layered them together and you know kind of found um, you know new snares out of that process um, but yeah essentially that's that's how I start um, and then you know going into the kick as well 
it's, it's, a, it's a much simpler sound, I, I think, uh, but it's done in very much the same process. You know, you start off with your transient, but you know, your, your kick drum transients are, you know, usually they're, they're sort of like biased around the kind of 2K, 3K range to get that kind of click. Um, fundamental again, I mean, this is actually, I'll, I'll use a different plugin for this often, uh, kick T. This, this is still really good for, for making snares actually, so you definitely bear that in mind um, when, when trying this out yourself. But um, with the kick drum here, again, it's kind of a here's one I made earlier, but um, I've used uh, this curve here to essentially control the pitch envelope of the kick drum. Um, and it, you know, it basically is just a sine wave, um, which you can you choose here. And then, you know, you kind of want to tell it what length you want the, the kick to be. So, you know, I've chosen here around, probably go for like, yeah, even sort of one, four, four milliseconds is quite a good length for a kick. So you don't want them to be too long so that, you know, you're filling out your low end too much and not giving enough room for your sub to really uh, come through, especially if you're working with like long sustained notes in your sub. Um, but yeah, so one, one, four, two is quite a nice little area you can go for. Um, you know, you're starting off the, the attack of the sound here. I've started about one, uh, sorry, nine, eight, eight. And then we're arriving down here at D1. But actually, you know, I'll often land, if I've written a tune in F, I'll land at low F, F1, at around 44 hertz. Especially in this track, I think I did that because, you know, my sub is on that low F. And if your kick is arriving at that low F, then you're going to avoid a lot of phase cancellation with your kick and your sub and the overall effect should be a bit more harmonious. Um, so yeah, there you go. That's, that's how I, I build the fundamentals of my kick in Kick2. Um, yeah, so now we've got our fundamentals sorted. Uh, moving on to the tail. So this um, is done in very much the same way as a snare tail, but because it's a much shorter sound, you know, you're, I've, I've used... Um, a kind of shorter decay on the white noise here in operator, giving it some room on the reverb. Oh, hang on. And then taking away a bit of a low end content. Um, again, I've added uh, another uh, part to the tail there because I, I, I felt like it sounded a bit too artificial. So I've got a layer here, which is, that's just like a live layer taken out of addictive drums. And again, another live layer here too. You know, so that's giving you a bit more mids in the kick as well, and I think that's quite crucial, you know, to help it sound like a real kick drum. If you put them all together, there you go. You've got a, got a half decent kick there. Um, yeah, again, like main takeaways of building your own kicks like this: you can tune them to the key of your track, you can control the pitch envelope and the dynamics of how you want them to sound. Um, and I think really like. Uh, more importantly for me is like you know when you when you've got full control over the fundamentals of both the kick and the snare you know you're just removing any phase issues so you know your tracks are really going to connect in the club on a, on a big system and have that weight because you're able to let the, the waveforms have full amplitude um, on, on either polarity without any phase issues and um, you know you're kind of delivering maximum kind of sonic accuracy so yeah that is uh, the kick and the snare more or less discussed. Um, yeah, so obviously that's not the kick and snare made in, uh, for this track, but uh, used a very similar process to get there. Um, so yeah, now just kind of going back into the main kick, I, uh, sorry, the main kit I used on Hackers. Just mute some of these layers. Um, so yeah, uh, in addition to the kick and snare, um, all there really is going on is a hat, which I'm pretty sure I took from another project. I think it was my collaboration with, um, with TC. Uh, but this, this is just a, a simple live hi-hat. It's very straight. Got a, bit of, got a bit of a fade in there, so we let our kick drum cut through. You know, that's what's going to give you that kind of weight as well of your drums when you're you're sort of ducking the kind of higher frequency elements against uh, you know your kick and your snares. So exaggerate that. Kind of really getting that punch there. Less so when it's like that. 
but yeah, with this track, I kind of wanted there to be um, a bit of hi hat present like, on that drop. So you know, kind of, it really feels like there's a, a strong kind of straight hi hat groove running through it. So yeah, so that's that's kind of how the track started. I mean, I, I started with the the riff and then went straight into the drums and just got those two kind of working well together. Um, so if I play them together, you'll hear. Oh, that's not the right one. We'll go for this one. There we go. So literally, with the riff and three drum parts, we've got pretty much the entire song, well not the entire song but at least the drop and, and that that is what I was aiming for with this track just to you know centre it all around very very simple minimal parts. You also notice as well like there's no sort of crashes or cymbals or anything like that going on on the drop. Um, you know this obviously has the benefit of not taking up extra headroom but um, you know, I think in, th in this track, like it, it worked. You know, I, I didn't need to add loads of crashes and cymbals. Um, so I think, you know, more or less, we're we're filling up the whole frequency spectrum. If I just pull up span again, we can see just from these few elements, and the curves looking pretty nice. Um, so yeah, uh, moving on to uh, other areas of the track. Um, I mean, I should probably just just you know go through what else I added to to the drums as it progressed so you know I mean this this, this track is kind of like a drum and bass track arranged like a techno track uh, in the sense that you know I'm bringing in other percussive elements as it progresses um, and in this case I've got here just really simple shaker and that you know that's that's kind of on, on the on the offbeat so that kind of really helps to groove along uh, it kind of increases the pace so when you hear it just as a straight beat and then when it comes in you kind of have that more you know eighth note feel to it and um, yeah so the, I mean this is a shaker that, that that's kind of just a stock uh, shaker that, that I've got in my library um, which I use in quite a lot of tracks and I, I wanted to make sure that it um, you know it wasn't clashing with uh, the kick and snare so anything I'm kind of adding into the, dr the drum track I'm going to, going to want to duck against a kick in the snare, and this applies to cymbals, hi hats, or, or whatever. Um, so here, LFO, LFO tool was doing the work for me. It's literally just, in this case, just ducking on, on that second kick drum there. Um, so yeah, so the, the, the shakers, uh, it was actually a, a mono shaker to begin with, but I wanted to add a bit of stereo whip to it. I, mean, I normally shy away from uh, sort of stereo widening plugins. Uh, because they can offer, uh, you know, they can introduce a lot of uh, phase side effects, um, meaning they won't sort of go down to, they won't work well in mono. Um, but Ozone have seemed to have overcome this actually with their Ozone Imager, and I use it a hell of a lot. And um, you know, if I take it off, just got like a, your bog standard mono shaker, whack it on, and now it's nice and wide. And, and what I've done there, I think it uses like a version of the Hass effect, but the Hass effect, when you when you sort of uh, delay two sounds and pan them hard left and right, that, that will uh, create pretty pretty bad phase issues when you put it down to mono, and also you, you get a bit of flam because it's essentially two samples happening in fast uh, sequence of each other, but with this it, it does seem to, to work quite well, and you know, all I've done here really is I've, I've just stereoized it, bit of delay going on there and then just push it up now we've got nice wide shakers um, moving on to yeah so here we've just got some toms this is kind of like filling out you know introducing the next section and th yeah this is very typical of my, my style I guess you know these kind of big 80s uh, toms this is from a pack called uh, Zenheiser which I really rate, um, and yeah, there's just so many good 80s drums in this one. Um, yeah, as you can hear, and that's you know that's just taken straight from the pack. Bit of a fade there to let the snare pop through, uh, and then next we've got a 909 ride. 
because again that that was kind of one of the, the, the that was one of the things which um i established after i'd got the basic concept of the track was to go right well now what is the theme of this track going to be like what what aesthetic do i or you know what what filter do i want to put on this or what you know so i was kind of thinking i was uh, you know kind of big into sort of sci-fi and and sort of like you know a lot of the kind of early 90s uh, references that inspire me um you know such as the game wipeout um like the chemical brothers the prodigy uh, also a lot, a lot of the uh, like cyberpunk films um there's a film that came out in the 90s called hackers which kind of ring, rings a bit of a bell with me and um yeah i just thought oh yeah I, I like the idea of hackers like i think that would be quite a strong concept for a track so i kind of built a lot of the the sort of the sounds around this track to kind of fit in with that that 90s kind of you know techy sort of cyberpunkish vibe um so you know instant sort of go-to would be you know 999 rides um which i've added into the, the drum track here Again, I've used that widening thing. So yeah, um, very much like the identity of the track was that, that kind of 90s kind of cyber inspired thing, um, which I wanted to get across. And um, first port of call really was to uh, call up the 909. Um, and as you can hear here in the build up, So we've got like, you know, these distorted kick drums here. These were lifted straight out of the Vengeance pack, actually. You know, I've got that kind of very, very sort of typical sound that I wanted to go for there. Got your 909 hats. 909 ride. 909 clap. So yeah, those, those, those I think helped a lot in, in, create, in creating this track's identity. Um, so if I, if I run this from the build up into the drop, you can hear how they're sort of like doing their thing. Oh, hang on, there you go, there's the build up. Um, so yeah, they, they, that, that was essentially, you know, the drums um, I made around the main drums on the drop, uh, just to sort of, you know, um, help along with the theme and, and just to, you know, have something a little bit different other than the typical sounds I might use in, in a drum and bass track. Um, so yeah, just to kind of like work backwards from the drop, which is pretty much how, how I made this tune. Um, now we've got, going back to the main riff. Uh, so let me just play that. Um, so I think originally I, I actually had like a, a synth thing going on before the drop, which sounded a bit like this. But it wasn't exciting me that much. So uh, instead, um, yeah, I, I kind of felt like that there's obviously the, the track started on the guitar, so I wanted to kind of bring a bit more of that guitariness in and uh, in order to do that, instead of I, I actually tried playing in some guitar originally, but I found that the the answer was a lot simpler than that. So what I ended up doing was taking the riff itself, bouncing it as audio, and essentially running it through a guitar amp. So if I just take off all the effects here. Yeah, so here we've got the riff. And what I did was I pitch, pitched that up 12, or pitched up an octave. Sounds a little bit bloated. Doesn't sound too clever at the moment, but um, I put it on the uh, complex play, pro algorithm because what that will do is it will sort of maintain a lot of the performance of the sound. So instead of pitching it, it up in sort of traditional audio sense, you know, you're moving everything up the frequency spectrum uh, relative to what pitch you set up. Whereas in complex pro mode, you know, it's, it's good because it, it maintains the, the sort of the, the frequency content above the, uh, the fundamental. Um, so in this case, that's what I needed it for. And um, yeah, essentially I, I ran it through, uh, I didn't use guitar rig in the end, but I used uh, the Ableton amp, um, but before taking out quite a lot of the low end. Mm -hmm. 
So as you can hear, that, that amp's actually making it sound like a guitar. And I've had quite a few people, people say to me, oh, was, was that actually a real guitar? But yeah, it's the synth being run, run through the, the soft tube Ableton amp. Obviously, I didn't want to overcook it too much. And um, yeah, there you have it. That's, that was essentially the, um, I, guess, I guess with this track, similar to some of my other tracks, I quite like the interplay of having you know, uh, the main hook of the track um, an octave above in the build-up and then an octave below on, on the drop. So you've got this kind of like high-low sort of juxtaposition thing going on. Um, did that in like my track Fatso and, and quite a few others. But yeah, so if you hear those together. And then incoming. So there's a real synergy between those two sounds because obviously they are the same sound. And um, yeah, so that, that was kind of um, establishing the build up. Um, and, and what I quite like, what I, wanted, what I wanted to do in this track was actually to have um, quite a, a sort of obvious, quite a crude introduction of this sound. So rather than have all the bells and whistles, you know, big booms like white noise sort of sweeping down and all, all that stuff. I literally just wanted the sound to be like there, like by itself, sparse. Um, I kind of, in, in a way, it kind of has more impact because of that. Um, if I run into when that happens, you'll get an idea of what I mean. Uh, so. So yeah, that was really just a, a creative choice just to just flip it the other way, you know, instead of going for the big obvious bells and whistles, just see if that, if that works better. Um, so once we've heard that riff for eight bars and the main hook's been established, I, I then started to introduce uh, the sort of rises and the build up. So um, yeah, all of that comes from here. Uh, listen to that. Yeah, so again, not a lot going on here, but um, I'll just expand a little bit in, into sort of how I made these risers. Um, you know, again, making your own risers, you can start the pitch of them in the key of your track, so they sound a bit more cohesive. And yeah, you know, you can just re-sculpt really them to fit the overall um, yeah, energy of, of what it is you're working on. So yeah, if I break down the riser here, essentially just uh, like a sawtooth, which are made in serum. Which is really simple. Uh, it's not even. It's just one voice. Um, here we've got the, the sort of pitch and uh, pitch in the the MIDI clip with with bit of bit of a lift at the start actually. Just a gives a bit more character, you know, rather than starting the track at, at the you know the, the starting pitch. Um, and then yeah, that's just rising up. Uh, it's rising up nine semitones. So it's like nearly getting to the to the top of the octave, but it's not quite getting there, which mean, which gives you that kind of anticipation of, of the, the, the drop coming, which will then be resolved when it hits, um, the bass hits on the tonic. So yeah, so that's pretty much the saw. And what I've got going on there is a frequency shifter. So I'm essentially like, you know, pushing the frequencies up as it rises. That's just Ableton's stock frequency shifter here. You kind of hear that it's, it's giving it quite uh, an interesting tonality as it moves up as well. It's quite a metallic effect. And then I've got this just very simple, call it jet, but uh, yeah, kind of mimics the sound of a kind of jet taking off. Which again, and all that is two sawtooths, an octave apart, and also a fifth apart, um, but two voices each, detuned. And yeah. That's uh, pretty much that sound. Um, again, uh, I actually didn't put that one through a frequency shifter, but I grouped those two together, the saw and the, the higher saws. And, uh, and then what I did was I automated uh, some of Ableton's overdrive just to kind of give it a little bit more intensity as it approaches the drop. So you're not just, uh, you know, 
um, having these sounds quite raw and clean as they're going into it, you're actually changing them over time to make them more intense. There you go. And uh, another thing I did there, you probably heard it kind of duck down a little bit at the end. And the reason why I did that was to actually carve out a little bit of room um, for the vocal, which I put before the drop. And the vocal, um, I tried various different things before the drop, uh, some of them quite comical, but the, the first one I tried at was uh, just to have uh, quite a sort of like a robotic voice talking before the drop. Um, I think it, yeah, I, I just made it say like, I am electric or something like that. Um, and it wasn't quite grooving right with me, but I'd just, I'd play it anyway, just to show you the kind of creative process I went through. So I thought I'd try and synthesize this robot voice if I play it to you. Right, so I mean, it kind of sounds a bit lame, but um, if I whack on the uh, effects chain, it sounds a little bit better. So that was the original idea I had, and um, I kept it in for this tutorial just because I thought it was quite uh, interesting how I put it together. Um, so I started off with just me talking kind of crudely into the mic. So I am electronic, which sounds pretty pretty rubbish. But what the the idea of that was to um, essentially just uh, create the the sibilance of the sound to make uh, make it sound a bit more realistic, so you're getting the S's and the T's. So completely, you know, high pass that. And then underneath, we've got this patch I made in Serum. So it's, it's, it's kind of made it talk, um, which, and, and how I did that was uh, just essentially using the formant filter here and then modulating it with LFO1. And here you've got it kind of sweeping down to create the eye. And like based on where, that, where the filter is at, it will make it sound like, you know, like a vowel sound, like a vowel shape. And obviously with the resonance cranked quite far up. So yeah, that's essentially how you do it. And you know, you can move these around. You know, without getting into um, sort of you know 2013 dubstep territory, but you know again that is kind of how that that sound was created as well using these formant shifting techniques. And um, yeah, I essentially just married that up with the the audio. So essentially, you know, you're kind of creating uh, you know sort of a half human, half computer talking voice. Um, and then yeah, it was just a case of like you know piling on loads and loads of uh, processing, starting with a redux to bring a bit reduction, some chorus, some overdrive, vocal synth here by Isotope, which is really good if you're kind of into your vocoded stuff, um, which uh, isn't actually adding anything. I think I used that for the, the, the voice itself, for the sibilance. Uh, little Alter Boy, which is really good just for like shifting formats around. Um, OTT, uh, OTT map, this is actually just a macro I created with uh, just the OTT preset on the Ableton's multiband compressor. Uh, rooted uh, on the macros here, just so you've got full control over it, combined with the reverb, just to really like, push things and make them very extreme sounding. Again, just some uh, EQ, more OTT, finishing off with Waves um, Arvox compressor, which is great for like bringing vocals up really loud. So anyway, um, without sort of, you know, talking too much about that sound because I didn't actually use that in the final uh, version. Uh, what I went for was just a simple spoken word saying hackers, which was this. Hackers. So I, actually, I, I was listening through a lot of um, uh, Mr. Robot, um, just trying to find somebody saying hackers and um, got the lead character uh, actually saying that. Um, as part of a full sentence. So I was originally using that, but I actually got the vocal, uh, got it re-recorded, obviously, to, to not infringe on any copyright. Um, and yeah, so very simple, just added. Hackers. Added a lot of, you know, com uh, sort of compression, multi band compression, some EQ, pretty wild. I actually matched the EQ with the original sample I used, hence why you've got these kind of crazy nodes here. Um, 
yeah, I kind of wanted it to sound as close to the original sample as possible, so using match EQ is quite a good way of doing that. And then, yeah, just like throw it through K clip, which is going to, you know, kind of crush it or, you know, clip it quite, quite, to make it louder anyway. Okay. So there you go, that's the pre drop sample, and it kind of brings the whole kind of theme of the track together, gives it an identity, and, um, you know, we, we hear that before, you know, each drop. Cool. So um, that's probably quite a good uh, jump off point to talk about, to kind of go into the intro and, and talk about the vocal that I used in the intro. Um, so kind of in line with the theme of the track, you know, the kind of 90s cyber aesthetic, um, I wanted to go for sort of quite an ethereal sounding vocal, you know, kind of reminiscent of uh, sort of early or orbital tracks. Um, and I used this really good library. Um, I'll play, the, I'll play the vocal first. Yeah, so that was, that was taken from a library called um, Ethera, which uh, I've, I've used quite, quite a lot over the years. Um, it's really great. Um, it's a content library. Oops. Yeah, so there it is, dry. I really recommend this pack for anyone who's looking for this this type, this style of vocal. Um, and then, yeah, just put it through a lot of processing. And um, you know, I kind of wanted to, it to have this kind of like stutter effect, this kind of trance gate um, effect going on. So I created a, an, a, an effect chain, separated it into two. On one chain, we've got Ableton's delay. And the second chain is where it gets a bit more interesting. Um, again, we've got a delay here. Big, big, like long reverb there, but seven seconds. Uh, take away a lot of the lows. Meta flanger, which gives like a really extreme kind of chorusing, flanging effect. Um, and then LFO tool, which this is what I use to create the, the kind of trance gate effect. If I solo that. Yeah, so I only wanted that. That, that sort of trance gate on the reverb delay to come in at certain points. So I automated that chain to, to kind of fade in and out. Um, there's also a second sort of trance gate thing going on on there, which is on, on, the, on the main sound, on the overall sound. Um, this one's at, at eight no uh, eighth notes, and uh, it kind of comes in a little bit earlier. You can see here I've like automated it to come in on the first four bars. Now let's turn that off. Uh, so there we go. So you can hear the the, the two trance gates coming in at different times, one after each other. There, that kind of gives it, it helps it sound less like just a sample out, out of um, a library, or it helps it give it a bit more identity, identity and a bit more you know dynamic interest. And um, that's also being sent to, um, we've got a bus down here, which is running uh, Valhalla Shimmer, which is an amazing sort of long spaced out reverb. You know, I use it on, on so many things. Um, combined with uh, UAD, uh, MXR, flanger and doubler. Again, kind of like a vintage flanger. Um, you combine all those together and then, you know, you've got really the aesthetic of, of, of the vocal nailed. Um, and uh, yeah, throughout the intro, I actually sent a lot of the sounds into into this uh, shimmer and flanger combination to kind of you know give give that that nice kind of flangey effect. Um, and uh, yeah, and if we kind of work our way back as well, you know, there there were a lot of other sounds I put into this which you know fitted in with the theme. And um, you know, one of those was this kind of like acid arp. Which kind of, this is kind of like the, the first hook that you hear, like the first melody, which kind of establishes the theme of where it's going. Yeah, so again, you know, we're, we're really harking back to the, these, this kind of early kind of, you know, cyber trance era here. And 
uh, this is a sound which, um, again, it's quite like, it's very resonant sound. I wanted to have, have quite a lot of like acid, acid resonant sounds in there, um, which, you know, kind of had that, you know, like I said, uh, said earlier, kind of wipe out, kind of chemical rubbers, you know, feel to them, Underworld. And, um, you know, this sound was created in Massive and, you know, a couple of key interesting things uh, I did here were, were uh, so here I've got like quite a lot of resonance uh, applied to the filter uh, and it's a low pass filter and then we've got that assigned, we've got that modulated by massive uh, step sequencer here. So it's arriving at different um, different uh, levels of, of, of cutoff filter um, for every sort of, uh, I think we've got eight, eighth note here. Um, so that's kind of moving as, as the melody progresses. And then also I've got the, uh, the pitch of the MIDI, uh, which is uh, modulated by assigning this down here, this KTR, to, and, and that is essentially modulating the resonance. Because in, in, the, in the lower registers, I didn't want the sound to be as resonant. And then as it moves into the higher registers, I wanted to, to get more resonance. So essentially, I, I did that by assigning KTR here. Uh, so that's, that's our ARP, uh, which is running through the intro. Um, and yeah, just to kind of like add into the soundscape of the track, I, I wanted a lot of like 303 acid sort of sounds. So you've got this, this sound here. You know, these are kind of textural, really. You know, and they're, they're kind of just adding to that to, to the soundscape. And yeah, this this one was uh, done in Silent here, and it's really all about uh, the ar arpeggio here with the velocity, um, which is you know essentially you know we've got that controlling the resonance, the really cr cranked up high resonance here, um, to give you that kind of real acid sound. Um, yeah, not not a lot going on with that sound otherwise. Um, Again, you know, other sort of, you know, times I've used sounds like that. So Monopoly, there's a Korg, it's an emulator. And, you know, this, again, this is quite, quite a random sound, really. You know, and I, and I basically just, um, it just kind of like evolves over time and does its own thing. And, um, you know, I essentially just recorded, you know, 16 bars of it. And then, you know, picked out a few of the good phrases, you know, to... Um, you know, picked out the, the, the best best phrases to use, you know, in the actual track. So I ended up arrived at, yeah, so j just like little like sprinkles, little kind of tastes of, of those sounds kind of put throughout the track. Um, so yeah, then we've got the, the vocal here. This was just, you know, the vocal pitched up with, uh, with some effects on it. Kind of pan left and right. Quite, quite dramatically. Um, and then, in addition to that, we've just got like a kind of like a long sustained bass. And that was created in Serum, uh, which you know is obviously great for doing those huge kind of super sore, wide unison, multiple voice sounds. Um, you know, in, in this case, we've got, you know, 16 voices of the first oscillator, 16 of the second oscillator, and then, you know, as many voices as we can find, really. You know, we've got one here coming from the sub, got some noise in there. And yeah, just like a long sort of decay on the filter to kind of... Because, you know, a lot, lot of the tracks back then, it was all about the, the, the big super, saw, super saws. Um, so I was trying to bring a lot of that in as, as possible. Um, and yeah, again, we've just we've got like a little bit of processing on there because I think when you're layering up lots of voices together, you're going to get a bit of like, you know, inconsistency with the um, the phase on on the fundamentals of the sound. So I wanted to try and level those out a little bit by putting some multiband on the low end, as you can see it here, working on the levels of the lower sort of harmonics and fundamental there, um, just to like even it out a little bit. And again, more of just a little bit of OTT there to straighten it out. Um, so yeah, that is more or less the intro. Um, I mean, it, again, like to, to kind of help 
the, the theme of the track, I added in quite a lot of sound effects. And I suppose that the most prominent ones are these like hacking sounds, which I found from the pack. And yeah, they're just like running through the intro just to give it that, that, that theme. Here you hear them all together. So yeah, very, very kind of subtle texture, ear candy, just like wide, just, you know, to, uh, you know, just really hit home the, the hackers theme, really. And again, just various kind of sounds I've, I've found that suit the, the soundscape of the track. Uh, we've got a sort of reverse clap running into some white noise, just all very standard you know, stock sounds, which I'd use at this, these kind of stages of the track. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, these are very, don't need to go into too much detail about these because they're just very simple sounds to make with white noise. A few little rhythm, rhythmical white noise chops, which kind of, kind of like hi-hats, you know, it's kind of more really part of the drum track, I guess. These two little up here. So yeah, all of these little things just to help it along, make it sound less less rigid. Um, and then as we lead into the the main uh, hook section, um, so we have this like very ethereal intro with with the, the the vocal and the kind of acid sounds and the arp, and. You know, I was kind of thinking, how do I get from A to B? You know, well, you know, one way of doing it would be to have loads of like kick drum fills and rolls and snare rolls, and then you know, you climb you, that all comes together, and you end in the climax of the hook coming in. Um, but that that kind of felt a little bit too much, and um, I felt again, you know, rather than doing the obvious, just go the other way. And I, all I've done really here to get to that stage is to just use some white noise traveling up. And then with our drums, again, they're not really doing much, they're just fading down. And then I suppose where it gets more interesting is what I did with all of the musical elements. So I grouped all these together. And then what I did was I used this great plugin here called Endless Smile by Dada Life, the guys that make uh, Sausage Fatner. And um, it creates build-ups, essentially. So, you know, I put all those sounds together. And then if I turn the intensity up, you know, you can choose a, a variety of different styles here. Um, you can actually turn sounds into risers. So. so, yeah, and that was, that was quite a subtle one. I mean, it, I think it's compressing the sound as it increases and it's also, you know, filter, it's sweeping up with a filter, uh, with increasing resonance. Um, and then, yeah, just because I, th I thought, you know, another trademark of this track is, is the kind of stutter effect that I used elsewhere of the vocals and some of the synths. I'll then introduce that as, as a way of, you know, um, sort of, um, you know, decaying this, this section as it goes into the next one. So again, I used LFO tool for that and, and I essentially just automated the volume here with uh, a fast, sort of volume envelope on, on the 16th. So there you go. Um, and that's how I got from A to B with this part of the track. Going back into the drop section, um, I want to discuss just a few of the extra sounds, a few of the complementary parts that Kind of gave it gave the track a, a little bit more interest as it moves along and um, yeah I guess one, one of the, the main ones here is uh, this complementary synth which um, it's like a kind of stab sound uh, so we listen to that and that works in, con in conjunction with uh, the main riff if we listen to those two together So yeah, that was that was again a very simple sound made in massive, and we've got we've got here just a, a square, two squares, 
actually three squares all laid up and they're at different pitches, one's at a fifth. And um, yeah, simple kind of uh, filter cutoff going on there on the envelope. And added a bit of Valhalla rim. So dry, it's like, kind of going to give it that space. Um, again, LFO tool here, kind of doing my side chaining for me. And this, this is plugins awesome, uh, Clarifonic uh, by Kush Audio. Uh, again, like this is this is a really good plugin for giving that top end air to a sound. As I was using passive EQ earlier in the track, but yeah, this one's modelled on an actual piece of hardware, and um, yeah, you can control sort of where you want that sort of air to be added uh, by you know choosing these shimmering silks. So you're not actually given much option to work with, but it's that for that reason it's good because you know it's like you usually know when a sound needs this plugin uh, as its treatment. Um, so yeah, with this one, you need a bit more brightness, call up the Clarifonic. And then the, uh, the other interesting thing going on here is that uh, I needed the, the riff to basically duck when that sound came in, so it kind of came up to the front a little bit more. And I did that using uh, Track Spacer, which is essentially a multi-band sidechain EQ. And, um, uh, in the new version of Ableton, um, I'm currently beta testing at the moment, but you can actually route in from uh, audio, uh, other audio ch tracks, which is a bit of a game changer. And here I've chosen the audio from that stab and used that to control track spacer to kind of duck the exact frequencies that that sound is making in order to create room for it without, you know, removing the sound entirely, which is what would happen with standard side chaining. So when you hit them together. So yeah, a kind of uh, you know, it's a more transparent way of, of you know mixing elements in, in if they're working against each other. Um, so yeah, and there's not a hell of a lot else going on on the drop. We've we've talked about the intro, talked about all the stuff going on in the drop. Um, so yeah, all that really remains is a few of the kind of like mixing uh, points that I wanted to go through. Um, and I touched upon earlier about the, the kind of mid-side uh, mixing that was was going on in this track, and and essentially what what I what I wanted to, to do in this track was to, you know, um, create create the the best balance possible between um, the, the the main riff and the drums and and where they occupy um, the mid and the sides. So if I just play the track to you. Um, we're basically playing just the sides, um, and I use a plugin here called um, MSED by Voxengo for that. It's a free plugin. It's really good. It's just going to isolate the sides here, so you can hear what's going on in the sides. So what we've got going on there is, you know, I, I wanted the drums to because the drums are, are essentially like a lot of the the side content in the drums is is in the top end, like from the hi hats. There's a bit of the snare in there as well, that kind of like wide 80 snare. Um, so, you know, really we're looking at, if I bring up span quickly so we can have a look at what's going on in the frequency spectrum. So we've got quite a strong bias around sort of 170, 180 to 200, and because of the harmonics in the snare here. Um, and then also where the hi hats are around sort of, well, five. K upwards, really. Um, so I wanted to kind of like emphasise those in the sides, um, and you know, make sure they were sitting there quite quite clean. And it was all about really EQing them against the the main riff. So as we can see, the main riff here is taking up most of the room around here in the mids. You know, we're looking from like, like kind of four hundred up to about two K. Um, really, that's where a lot of the emphasis is there, and and I, I wanted to like carve out the room in, in the sides for the tops and the lows of the drums to kind of shine through and have their own space. So, the way I did that was to use Ableton's uh, EQ8, put it in side mode, just rolled off all of the tops, which is quite an extreme thing to do, and I wouldn't do that on the entirety of the sound because it would sound weird. Um, but as the sound already sounds strong in mono, full frequency, I thought, well, I can get away with actually just taking away all of the tops here and allowing the tops of the drums to fill up that space in the sides. 
And then, you know, similarly, I've taken away a lot of the high mids there. So, you know, when they're together, I mean, but by itself, that sounds quite, quite like a harsh cut. But if you play them together, like the tops of the drums are filling out that space. So what you've got going, going on there is just like, uh, I was trying to achieve as, as separated um, information as possible in the sides to create like an even and balanced uh, stereo field. Um, and obviously when I take that off, Oh, so that wrong one. So yeah, that really helps you know your mix to communicate well in the stereo field, and, and obviously there, there's like literally zero content there in in the subs. Everything from about you know about 170 down. You know you really want to keep that that phase absolutely locked by removing any content below those frequencies. Yeah, the next uh, crucial part of the mixing process um, I looked at is uh, the sub and uh, its relationship with the kick and the snare because obviously these are the two uh, loudest elements in the mix. Um, with the drums, with the kick and the snare, you're fundamental in, the, in this case. If I have a quick look at that, I'll pull up, uh, let's have a little pull up Exascape here. Right, so I'll put a low pass on that just to show you what's going on. So yeah, that's where our fundamental is, and you know that's taken up a lot of room in the mix. You know that's nearly it's hitting about minus two dB, um, equally with the snare drum. Pretty pretty loud. I forget the. Uh, there you go. And I, li I like to keep those fundamentals as close in volume as possible. Um, um, so yeah, uh, if we have a look at the kick and the snare and the sub together, we'll see that it's causing all kinds of like phase issues. Oh, hang on. Yeah, so we literally that's maxing out the headroom. We don't we don't want that at all. So at the time of writing this track, um, I was using LFO tool uh, to carve out the room for the fundamentals of the kick and snare with the sub. I switch that on. We can see what it's doing. So yeah, that's that's quite nicely just carving everything out. And um, now we can get our track nice and loud uh, because the you know the the fundamentals of the kick and snare are, are mixed nicely. Um, I did want to bring to your attention uh, my new approach of doing this, which is using a plugin called Chain Shaper, which I'm currently beta testing, but. Um, I think by the time you hear this, it will be out. And it is essentially, um, it's like Ableton's compressor. You can use it to sidechain. You can assign it to any uh, track in the arrangement. But the beauty of it is you can use it like out of photo. So you can actually draw in your own custom curves in order to you know, create the, the ducking that you, you want. So if I just give you a quick example, um, I'll turn off LFO tool here. I've got an instance of Chain Shaper, and I'm going to assign that to our kick drum. So, assign our kick drum. There we go. And then the great thing about it is it's got an oscilloscope built into it, so you can actually see what's going on. And here you can actually, you know, you can draw in your curve, so. And there we've got like sample accurate ducking, like literally in seconds, like really, really good. And uh, yeah, the great thing about it is because it's actually reading the transient of the audio file, you know, you can actually bring the ducking right up to that transient if you if you need to. Like if you're, if you're, if you're applying this like mids and tops and stuff like that, where you don't want is extreme ducking, you're gonna be able to like just bring it right up to the transient there. Um, so yeah, I, I, and, it, and that is really like solves a lot of the, the side chaining issues. I think in Ableton, you know, with regards to like plug and delay compensation. Like for example, I could introduce uh, a limiter in front of this, and the uh, the latency will already be calculated. So we, we need not worry about that. So yeah, very effective. Um, and then when it comes to uh, side chaining against my snare drum, pretty much the same principle. Attach that to my snare. Bit of a less of a cut 
cut on there. So there you go, uh, we've side chained our kick and a snare. You can then go a bit deeper if, if you're sort of working with, you know, fuller frequency sounds. And, um, you know, you can delve into uh, the multiband uh, section of it as well, which will allow you to sort of duck, uh, you know, low, mids and highs independently. So often what, what, what I do these days is actually like bus or, you know, send all of my musical and, you know, everything apart from the drums into its own sidechain track. So I'll give you a quick demo of that. Root that down into sidechain. And then we'll whack a chain shaper on there. We'll root that to our kick and snare. And obviously in, th in this case, let's take off our effects on here because we don't need those anymore. Um, So yeah, in, the, you know, in this case, we've got like literally everything running into uh, Chain Shaper, everything into one one channel essentially. Um, so then we can actually harness uh, the multiband. So in this case, I'd I'd want the one. So I'd I'd want the uh, essentially the, the lows to be, you know, cut quite harshly. So we'll do a curve maybe like that. The mids, you know, less harshly, so, you know, they can sound a bit pumpy if you have that in too hard. Then highs, obviously, really just want the transient clicking through, so we'll put that about there. And then, essentially, what we have there is, you know, quite nice, transparent, accurate side chaining. Yeah, and obviously, just, you know, I did that for, for demonst demonstration purposes, but, yeah, you get the idea. And, um, you know, it really makes that kind of side chaining thing uh, less of an issue because you just have that sitting on one channel that everything's rooted into and it's doing the right things uh, with your, um, you know, the different bands of the spectrum. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's pretty much it with, with regards to, to mixing and how I went about mixing this track and, you know, just going in, into a little bit more detail about how I do it um, these days. And... Um, I suppose the only the only other thing to touch upon is what I've got going on on, on the the master bus, and uh, yeah, I mean in this track I, I tried to get and generally tried to get the mix downs to a level where they actually don't need any additional EQ or compression um, at the final mastering stage, um, and and this this track happened to be one of those, and you know it required very little. Um, so yeah, these these utilities are just very functional, just to like you know just to kind of decay uh, the, the chain at the end of any like reverb tails at the end of the track. So as you can see there, that's all that gain is doing. Another uh, gain here, uh, sorry, another utility here just to bring the level down a little bit. And I'd, I'd use this to maybe check, you know, the um, sort of the, the mono compatibility here. Um, obviously Voxengo MSCD to check the sides, so, but you can also do that in utility. Um, and then yeah, just like ozone, ozone maximizer on the on the final, and you know I, I usually run it in um, sort of modern mode with the character right down, which is it's kind of clipping, but it's it sounds good and it's transparent, and um, yeah, I like things to be um, you know quite clean and transparent. So so yeah, there you go, that's it. Okay guys, that's all we've got time for. Um, thanks for watching the video and I really hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you want to find out more about me, check out my website, www.metricmusic.com and um, yeah, all the best. Cheers.